I'm delighted that we're starting the day with an absolute expert on this topic for a keynote um, interview entitled Decoding Quantum Computing and the Future of AI. So to discuss quantum computing, AI, and other new technologies, please join me in welcoming to the stage the theoretical physicist, activist, futurologist, and popular science writer, Michio Kaku. Welcome, we really are thrilled to have you here today. Um, and interestingly, we've been talking a lot about AI, and I'm sure we'll get to that in a minute, but you have recently been very focused on a different computing technology, uh, which is quantum computing, which I think you believe we ought to be paying more attention to. So I realize this is a very tall order, but if I was unfamiliar with quantum computing um, and how it differs from ordinary computing, how would you explain the difference? Let's start there. But I realize that's an incredibly, <laughs> incredibly difficult question. But how do you explain it to somebody who has no preconceived knowledge of it? Well, AI is a revolution in software. That is, people program lines of code to insert into an AI machine. However, quantum computing is hardware. We're talking about being able to replicate Mother Nature as she really is. Think about it for a moment. Mother Nature is not digital. Mother Nature does not use zeros and ones, zeros and ones. Where in the universe do we have zeros and ones, zeros and ones? Only in your laptop, only in computers. Mother Nature is quantum, right. quantum mechanical. That's why we can't use digital computers to solve cancer, Parkinson's, to solve the energy crisis, fusion power. All these questions are quantum mechanical. So you cannot ask a digital computer to solve a quantum mechanical problem. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Right. We are going to follow Mother Nature. That's the language of the universe, not digital, not digital coding. That's only here on the third planet from the sun. OK, brilliant. So it sounds like if we could get quantum computing to work, there'd be lots of things we could do with it. How is a quantum computer different from something like this in practice? What does it look like? How does it work? Well, an AI machine is basically a counting machine. It simply counts things, uh, things that you can touch, things that you can feel. Quantum computers deal with things you cannot touch, cannot feel. We're talking about molecules. Why can't we cure cancer? Why can't we cure many of the diseases that afflict the human race? Why is fusion power unstable? All these questions Mother Nature solved billions of years ago. And so that's what we want to do, learn from Mother Nature by using quantum mechanics, which is the language of the universe, rather than digital, which is nothing but zeros and ones, zeros and ones, zeros and ones. But, but to be clear, it sounds like you're saying that digital computers were a bit of a, a wrong turn and they're sort of unnatural. And I understand that they're unnatural, but we're not talking about quantum computers making digital computers go away, are we? They're going to work together once we get the quantum computers to work. That's right. It's like your left hand and your right hand. You need artificial intelligence as software to do practical problems, but there are limitations. Limitations in the power of the, uh, of the digital computer. You ask a digital computer to retard the aging process. Why do we have to die? The digital computer doesn't know what to do with that. A quantum computer, that's the province of quantum computing. The aging process, why molecules make us sick. All of that is within the province of quantum computers, which is a hardware problem. They complement each other, left hand and right okay. hand. So I've seen some pictures of quantum computers, and I have to say they look kind of weird. Uh, there's that IBM one with all the wires, and I really don't know what's going on. What is going on? What is a quantum computer made of? Because it's not made of chips and memory and stuff like that. First of all, the, the pictures you see in the newspaper is of a chandelier. A yeah, yeah, that's chandelier. the one, that's the one. What's going on with that chandelier? That's not the quantum computer. No? The quantum computer is the little box at the right. bottom. Right. So next time you see the chandelier, look at the very bottom. Right, okay, well, so what's the chandelier box. doing there? Cooling pipes. Right. Because you have to bring it down to near absolute zero. So you don't want to have uh, jiggling. You don't want to have vibrations, noise. Uh, because we are talking about molecules now. We're not talking about transistors. Yeah. Transistors are out the window. We're talking about molecules. That's why we have to cool them down to near absolute zero. Now, Mother Nature 
does it even without absolute zero technology. Mother Nature is, again, still one step ahead of us. But we need to be able to control them, so we have to be able to cool them down. So inside this computer and inside a digital computer, you've got a bunch of transistors that are switching on and off, and they're doing logic. In a quantum computer, then, you've got super cold atoms. How are they, how do you get them to do computing? How do you get them to connect to each other and, you know, do logic? Well, when you think of a transistor, a transistor is in two states, up and down. Think of a spinning electron. A spinning electron could be spinning up, or electron could be spinning down. The world economy is based on this fact right. that you can spin up or spin down. That's the basis of the wealth of modern society. But quantum computers, computers can go at any angle whatsoever. Now here's a question for you. How many more states are there if you could go any direction than up and down? And the answer is infinitely. There are infinitely more states that you can have if your electrons can go in any direction rather than up and down. Now you know why quantum computers are infinitely more powerful than a regular computer. So um, I wanted to ask you this, because this is the thing that intrigues me the most about quantum computers, and uh, who better to ask than you. If I've got a quantum computer with n qubits, then it could be in the in two to n two to the n states simultaneously. In effect, unlike a digital computer, which can only explore one of those states at a time, and it can, it can explore all of them. So you get this incredible exponential speed up. One of the theories that people have as to why quantum computers are so amazingly much more powerful is that that quantum computer is talking to versions of itself in parallel universes. And in effect, you're using multiple universes worth of computing to get, to get your answer. Do you think that's a plausible explanation for what's going on here? Is, the, is a quantum computer accessing the multiverse? Well, we usually don't talk to people about the multiverse because it scares them. OK. <laughs> that sounds like you think it might be real, though. <laughs> but that's what it does. That's what's going on, folks. Okay, this so you're computer using... computes in the multiverse. Now, this is not the same as the metaverse, we should point out. The metaverse is you know, Mark Zuckerberg playing VR, which is awesome, by the way, but, um, but nothing to do with this. right? Okay, and it's also nothing to do with Marvel. Is when, it? when you were a child, your mother told you you cannot be two places at the same time. Right. That's been drilled into you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cannot be two places at the same time. Well, your mother lied to you. <laughs> well, actually, isn't it more that there are multiple me's in the same place? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, never mind. This is making my head hurt. Um, <laughs> so Things start to explode yeah, yeah, yeah. when you think about this. OK, right? but roughly, you've got these super cold atoms um, possibly talking to their their siblings and other universes. And what I, there's some of these, there are different device, different designs of quantum computers, right? Where you, some of them you fire lasers at things and some of them you have ion traps and that. I mean, there's, there's no single way of doing this, is there? It's a race. Right. It's a race between China on one hand and Google and IBM and Microsoft and many of the other computer companies. Who are you betting on? Uh, well, right now, most of the betting is on the, using the electron, because the electron right. exists in multiple states. But a photon, a particle of light, can also exist in multiple states. And that's what the Chinese are working on. And the Chinese version does not have to be cooled to near absolute zero. Right. That's one advantage. However, it's kind of clumsy, because you're dealing with mirrors now. While with electrons, you can deal with very small microscopic lenses. And, and devices. But it's a race, we'll see, because any quantum mechanical process can, in some sense, be used as a basis for a quantum computer. So how many designs are there? In principle, an infinite number right. of designs. OK, so in this race, how can we tell who's winning? Because people have been trying to build quantum computers for decades, and they look like they get slightly closer to being useful every year, but they're still not useful for anything. So how can we tell who's winning and how, how close they are to the finish line? Well, the company, the, the uh, corporation or the country that gets the first quantum computer is not going to tell anybody. Right. They're going to sell gonna it to the it government. They're going to keep it a secret because <laughs> right. then they can break into anyone's code. Why bother to announce the fact that you got a quantum computer when you can now eavesdrop Okay. On everyone else's computation. Well, we'll get to why that is in a minute. But do you think that the NSA or whoever has secretly done this already? Do you think there is actually a quantum computer out there that we don't know about? Uh, no. No, okay. <laughs> However, in a time frame of five to ten years, right. uh, if you miss the boat, you're going to be out of it. Right. Just like if you miss the boat with, with transistors, you're out of it. Can you imagine computing with vacuum tubes? If you miss the boat, you're out. And but the same thing with quantum computers. Now is the time to think about jumping into the game. 
It's still a little early, but now is the time to read about it, understand it, understand your potential, understand what, mar what niches there are in the market. Now is the time to look. Right, now the code breaking is an interesting example because it's where the quantum computer meets the digital computer. With the digital computer, you have all these possible you know, answers to, the, to what the public key is, and with a quantum computer, if you could build one, you could basically look at all universes simultaneously to find the answer. By but, God, she, he's got it. Well, but, so but that's the bit, that's the bit, <laughs> see, I'm a normal, I'm a computer scientist, but I'm a like, digital computer scientist. What you're talking about with the, using these quantum computers for simulating reality, is different, isn't it? That's not crunching numbers in the same way. It's, it's using them to actually simulate quantum systems. So how, um, does, how, do, how does that work? Because that's different from cracking codes, isn't it? Uh, yeah, well, we're talking about uh, the practical applications of this in terms of energy, uh, biology, medicine, chemistry. Uh, we're talking about chemistry without chemists. Right. Biology without biologists, okay? But how do you do it? Because you're not just, I mean, how do you have this very cold atoms? How do you do chemistry with that? Well, take a look at cancer. 50% of all cancers involve one broken gene, P53. And you can model that. It's a molecule. You can model that with a quantum computer. Think about that. A quantum computer attacking cancer. You can't do that with a digital computer. How do I model it, though? That's what I don't get. I've got a bunch of atoms. That's different from a very, very big molecule in DNA. So how do I simulate one of them with the other one? Because you have an equation for that molecule they call the Schrodinger wave equation, right. which is first year uh, graduate physics. And using that equation, you can use that to guide the motion of each, each atom within the molecule. And then you can look for defects, because you can now simulate, you, you're simulating reality. You're simulating a chemical reality that is outside the domain of a digital computer. Digital computers are, cannot even touch this. We're talking about looking into the molecule itself, the molecules of life and death. So I know how difficult it is to, you know, protein folding is one of the things that um, uh, computers have been applied to, and AI seems to have been quite useful there. But this is actually simulating the quantum mechanical process inside those, those atoms. Uh, you've talked about medicine, but there are other uses for this too in material science and so on. So if we manage to get this to work, what are some of the uh, other benefits that we might be able to, to see? Uh, you've mentioned the medical ones, I think. Uh, what, are, what are some of the others? Well, take a look at um, uh, energy. Uh, why don't we have operating fusion reactors? Because hot plasma is unstable. It's very difficult to control super hot plasma that's hotter than the interior of the sun. And so imperfections start to occur. This is where quantum computers come in, because you can model the magnetic field so that it stabilizes it, and then you can heat it up to the temperature of the sun. And so energy could be a byproduct of quantum computation. Well, that would be handy, um, an infinite amount of energy from, um, from fusion power. People have been using AI to try to predict these instabilities in, um, in fusion reactors, but you think a quantum computer would be a superior way of doing it? I think a combination of both. Right. Because remember, uh, AI is limited by the amount of, of em en uh, memory it has, right. limited by the software, the programming. The limitation there is hardware. And that's where quantum computers come in, because quantum computers have essentially infinite amount of hardware compared to the regular software that we use. In all those other universes. Um, so I, I've, I've been watching this closely. In fact, we have, um, at The Economist, we've been doing a series of events on quantum, because we think it's getting, getting close. Mm -hmm. um, but what would your best get be? I think you said, uh, um, I think you said five to 10 years. That's think? just a personal guess, but right. we don't know, because you know, breakthroughs happen all the time. Yeah. This field is growing exponentially. Right. The exponential curve on a day-to-day -day basis sounds like nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. Well, no, I do see the and curve going up, but I don't know where it has to go up to. So I see things like quantum volume going up, and I see the number of qubits that that's right. IBM fits on a chip, although that's not actually the same as the number of logical qubits, is it? So I see the number, number go up. Go up, right. But, but They're uh, going up exponentially. Right, which is also great, but um, and that means that whatever number you want to get to, you'll probably get there pretty soon. But I just don't know what, where do we... What number does the quantum volume have to be or the number of gates on an IBM chip have to be before we can do something useful? Uh, well, first of all, the big question is, the $100,000 question is right. the question of the stability of this process because right. of error correction. Right. Errors start to creep in, okay? And we want to make sure that we can correct that by having another layer yeah. of qubits. And so you have more than one layer of qubits. Then the question is, how many qubits do you need? Yeah. We don't know because we're dealing with quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a crapshoot. 
It deals with probabilities. It doesn't deal with certainties. It deals with probabilities. That's why we have life. Life itself is a byproduct of probabilities. And therefore, you cannot definitely say on te at 10 o'clock, five years from now, right, right. we will have solved this problem because of the fact that that's the nature of quantum mechanics. It deals with probabilities rather than certainties. But we are able to keep these things going for a fraction of a second to do like one or two operations. Mm -hmm. So is that number, the number of operations you could do before the whole thing decoheres, is that going up? Are you confident that we're it's making It's all progress? going up. And remember, two years ago, we hit quantum supremacy. Quantum supremacy is the point where on one specific task, yep. quantum computers are millions of times better than a regular computer. We've passed that point. But now we want an all-purpose quantum right. computer. So because we passed that point on one very specific algorithm. And That's I think, right. I think, and this was the Google paper, right? That's and I right. think some people dispute whether that really was well, that we could debate whether it was deal. a million times yeah. or a billion times better well, than a digital computer. Well, I think basically computer. someone found a better classical algorithm in that case and just said, well, if you did it this way, it's not that much faster on a quantum computer. So uh, yeah. is that really quantum supremacy? Uh, well, it depends on how you define quantum supremacy, yeah. okay? But yeah, you have a point there that it is fuzzy. And so the question is, at what point can someone announce the fact right. that they have a quantum computer? You can't, because it is a question of probabilities. Right. That's the language of Mother Nature. Mother Nature does not deal with a crapshoot with, with a definite uh, uh, dice com coming up in a certain way. Um, so I think the analogy with AI is quite interesting because AI, like quantum computers, and indeed like fusion, was a technology that didn't work for decades, and then suddenly it did. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to be the sort of change that we see with, with quantum computers, that they're going to very quickly go from a, a science experiment to a useful thing? That's right, I think so, because breakthroughs are happening exponentially. And remember that Mother Nature has already solved the problem of temperature. Mother so, Nature so we know already, it can be done. Right? We know it can be done. Right. Just go outside, go outside, the trees, the forest, the insects. The fusion reactor in the sky. Yeah, that's right. We know it's, that can be solved. It's all quantum mechanical. The universe is quantum mechanical. Right. And we're just beginning like children to learn the language of nature. Just like a baby babbling, we are babbling with the language of Mother Nature, which is quantum mechanics, okay? So that's why I'm, I'm saying that I think that we will solve these problems of temperature, okay? But right now, they are formidable. Okay, now continuing with this sort of analogy with AI, which I think is, um, I can be quite illuminating. So we've got the doesn't work for decades, then it works. Th another thing that with AI is it has potentially great benefits, which we've been talking about, but potentially big drawbacks that we've also talked about. And that's also true with, with quantum, isn't it? We've been talking about these good things. You could, you could uh, make new drugs and all the rest of it, but there are also some drawbacks. So what are, what are some of the things we need to be a bit worried about if this suddenly starts working? Well, the crown jewels of any intelligence agency are the codes, the nuclear codes, the codes for wealth, the, co the codes for machinery, spying, things like that. A quantum computer, in principle, can break through most of those, most of those codes. And so the nation that first gets a quantum computer that can break into other people's codes, they're not going to announce it. They're simply going to do it. Right. And break into everyone's computers, steal all the secrets, all the crown jewels, and then say, oh, by the way, we stole everything you have. So yeah, that is a problem. Because this, we're not talking about the nature of coding itself. So some people say that because um, existing crypto cryptographic systems are vulnerable to a quantum attack, um, and because it takes a long time to upgrade our software, we need to get started on the upgrade now. And I don't know if you saw that announcement this week, but Apple is about to put what's called PQC, post-quantum cryptography, into the iMessage software. So this is a new algorithm for the encryption that they think can't be broken even by a, a quantum computing. So they are doing their part. They're starting to roll out this, this new software. Do you see anyone else doing this? Because I mean, I've heard people in the field say, yeah, we need to upgrade our, our crypto software, but do you see anyone doing this? Uh, no, I think it's still premature, right. okay? Because we're not at the point where one country can break into everyone else's quantum computers. That's years away but, right, in the but, future. But, if, but it will take years to do the upgrade, so don't we need to get started now? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, that because it'll take years to create this right. process, and a few years into the future where it's going to be relevant, that now is the time to prepare for that time right. a few years into the future. Right, because we know it's going to happen. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. Somebody's going to announce uh, a quantum computer and freak people out. Yeah, exactly. So, well, but I mean, uh, in America, NIST, the standards body, has announced these new post-quantum algorithms that it thinks everyone should use. And some people say it's a bit early, and that actually we don't really know whether those 
algorithms will be able to withstand a, a quantum attack. Right, so I think a post-quantum algorithm, yeah. you have to be very careful when you say those words, yeah. because a quantum algorithm powerful enough can probably break into that code. It's just that at the present time, and we, don't think we can. cannot break into that post-quantum cryptography. So then people say the answer to this vulnerability is that we use quantum computing itself and quantum networking to create a basically unbreakable um, cryptographic system and a, 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 a network that you can't snoop on. And again, that's using the fundamental principles of, of, uh, of quantum mechanics, isn't it? So how does that work? My personal point of view is use quantum to defeat quantum. Right. The only thing that can defeat a quantum computer is another quantum right. computer. And so, for example, polarization vector. If I have a light beam that, uh, like, come from, come from the sun, it polarizes in one direction. If somebody tampers into that light beam, the polarization vector changes. You now know, using the laws of quantum mechanics, that somebody is starting to steal into your secrets. So that's the way to do it. Put all your, your mechanic, I mean, all your secrets on one, one laser beam right. and watch that polarization vector. Once the polarization vector starts to tilt, then boom, shut things down. You know that someone's tampering into your system. That uses quantum mechanics to defeat quantum mechanics. Great, so we, have the, we need to build new optical networks that use these untappable un, uh, uh, photons, and uh, then we use those, to, I think, quantum key distribution to, sounds like a bonanza for the, for the hardware industry. They're gonna have to sell us all new computers, and new networking gear, and a whole load of new software. Um, someone's gonna make a fortune from yeah, this. Yeah, my personal point of view is there could be eventually two layers of the internet, one layer for everybody who is out there, you know, uh, trying to make, make a buck, whatever, and then the banks, the multinational corporations, the CIAs of the world, right. they will have their own secure network by the laws of quantum mechanics cannot be broken into. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about fusion because that's the other area where, um, where really fundamental physics, the kind of thing you've spent your life studying, could make a massive difference. Um, again, I kind of get the feeling fusion, one of these things that people have been trying to get to work for 10 years, for, for decades. Um, the, 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 fu the what's it called? The energy of the future, but you know, perpetually in the future, always 50 years away. There's suddenly a lot of um, investor interest in fusion. There's lots of startups doing it. What's going on? Does that mean we're getting closer? Do you think we're gonna see a fusion reactor um, in the next few years? Well, first of all, we know that fusion works. Just look outside yeah. and see the sun. The fact we have stars in the sun, we know what works. The problem is that gravity has a north pole, but not necessarily a south pole. It has one pole. While magnetism on the Earth has two poles. Therefore, it's very difficult to stabilize two poles, a north pole and a south pole. So what do we do? We bend it into a circle. Right. And that, that's the tokamak that we have uh, in southern France. So we have two designs, one in Livermore, which is based on laser beams, and the other one based on these donuts uh, using uh, magnetism. And in principle, it could work. The problem is stability. That as small fluctuations build up, they, they build up and they ruin the stability of the gas. Then all bets are off. That's where quantum computers can come in. Well, quantum computers can calculate the instability of the gas, compensate for that. So you have the other magnetic fields surrounding the donut making small corrections. That's a possibility. So uh, the startups that are trying to do this now, um, I mean, there's what, I think it was JET has just, is that the south of France one? Um, it, they've just shut it down. They with shut this, it down, right, with, uh, They did the final reaction where basically it didn't matter if they broke it. Um, and they got more energy out than they put in, but only for like a, a, a fraction of a second. It sounds like you're saying um, we might, uh, well, if we had a quantum computer, it would help us get to fusion. Uh, obviously, these companies that are trying to do it and researchers trying to do it are trying to do it without quantum computing. These are both kind of five to ten year-ish things, right? If you had to bet, which one do you think would happen first? Uh, which one? The fusion, fusion reactor? Fusion or, or the quantum computer. Do you think we need the quantum computer first? Well, I think fusion is going to come first because right. already in uh, southern France, yeah. uh, we have the ITER fusion reactor, oh, right. which has already demonstrated that it can hit break even. So, but only um, break even for a very short period. So. Uh, well, we, wanted <laughs> we don't want your light to flicker after a few seconds, right? Right. right. Uh, but they claim, they claim that they can reach a break even uh, right. with the, uh, the ITER. That's uh, what the they, claim is. I think I've never understood. So this is where you're crunching hydrogen together to make helium, uh, like the sun does. Um, then we're going to need a lot of hydrogen, aren't we? Um, and some, you know, there may be hydrogen under the ground, but where do you get the fuel for the... At the moment, we worry about where are we going to get the lithium and where are we going to get the uranium, where do you get the oil and the gas? Um, 
assuming you can make this technology work, where do you get the fuel from? it? From seawater. Right, you just electrolyze the sea. That's right, and there's lots of seawater out there. Right. So that's not the bottleneck uh, with uh, fusion reactors. There's plenty of hydrogen out there. And once you've got the hydrogen reactor working, you just take a little bit of the energy to electrolyze a bit more water to make a bit more fuel, so it kind of fuels itself. Uh, yeah, you could do that. But then, of course, you want to use that energy to fuel cities, to fuel metropolises, and to, to, uh, you know, to reap the benefits of this reaction process. Right. We want the power of the sun to light up the, the world. Absolutely. But, and, and uh, our own little suns that we can control. Brilliant. Um, well, I want to be able to open up to the floor so, 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 uh, so we can have some questions from the audience. So do we have any questions from the audience? We have a question over there, and we have a couple over here. Let's start over here, and then we'll go over there. Thank you very much. That was a terrific uh, dialogue. Uh, just have a quick question, because I'm not a scientist. Um, I'm, in fact, a philosopher at HKU. And I just wanted to ask about semiconductors and the relationship between you know, semiconductor race and rivalry and quantum computing, if any at all. Because what we're hearing these days is that, you know, whether it be the, the end of the Moore's Law or that increasingly the chip competition is going to be multifaceted as opposed to just about being about the light, so to speak, that there's a concern that we're running out of room to grow when it comes to shrinking the chip size. To what extent does this, if at all, have bearing on quantum computing, or are we simply conflating two irrelevant orthogonal questions here? Oh, Thank you very much. Good question. Where, does this, where, does this, where do we, you stand? We are seeing the end of Moore's Law. Moore's Law says the computer power doubles every 18 months. That's been the mantra for the last 50 years until just the last few years. We actually see the fact computer power is not doubling every 18 months. Something has to pick up the slack because transistors are now maybe like uh, 10 to 50 atoms across. That's how big the smallest transistor is. If you are 50 uh, atoms width with a transistor, why not go all the way down to zero? That's what quantum computers have. Quantum computers are the next step beyond silicon because silicon is unstable at the atomic level. That's the reason why your silicon chip is not going to get much faster in the coming years. While quantum computers live, live in the subatomic realm. And that's the advantage of quantum computers over digital computers, which have their own death warrant. But just to be clear, I'm not going to own a quantum computer. I'm not going to have one in my pocket. This is going to be a thing that lives in the cloud and makes right. stuff go faster, right? I, I'm, I'm not going to see, I'm, I'm just going to see everything getting faster because bits of it are being done on a quantum in computer. In the future, you'll simply talk to the wall, and right. the wall will talk back to you. Okay, and how it works behind that, um, I, I won't care. Um, well, I think we have two more questions over here. So there we have one there. Hello? For Firstly, really, I'm, I'm really a big fan of your view. I, I, I will watch your shows from National Geographic uh, for quite a long time. I'm really a big fan. And my question is that, uh, you know, from economic speaking and anthropology speaking, right? So every human uh, solid, every human society ev evolution, correlated, driven by the energy revolution, right? And uh, now from our, you know, daily research and observation, now the current, uh, the economic situation world, worldwide have, have, have a tendency largely will, will, will fall into stagnation. So I was wondering, just like you, you have just said, with the power of a quantum com computer, do human race have the possibility to generate the next real so solid next gen gen generation controllable nuclear reactor power, power, power cells or power batteries so that uh, we can really catapult us, catapult the human society into the ne next stage solid human evolution. Yeah, I mean, if we have basically free energy from fusion power, what does that mean for society? Well, how are we constrained by energy now? What could, how could the world look different? Well, energy could become for free once we, have, uh, once we have fusion power, because that is the power of the universe. The universe does not use uranium. Uranium, for example, is dirty, creates nuclear waste, has meltdowns, will have catastrophes. You name it, the problems with, with uranium uh, are mount. But if you take away that constraint, if we have free energy, you know, what are the implications of that? I mean, it's, it, I, can't, you know, I can't imagine what that changes. Um, what, what, suddenly, how does the world look different? Well, it will have planetary implications. Uh, the cost of creating things is going to drop tremendously. And the uh, job market is going to open up because people have to maintain the infrastructure, right? So I think it's a plus. 
is a plus in all directions. It's a sort of Star Trek future where, I mean, the idea is Star Trek, they don't have money and, you know, it's automated, fully automated luxury communism, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's um, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, you can only have that world. In Star Trek, you can walk up to the replicator and ask it to make you anything. Uh, you can only have that kind of stuff if you've got free energy, right? I think we'll have the replicator later. Okay. <laughs> Fusion first. Oh, no, we've run out of time. We can't talk about replicators. Um, okay, well, I'm afraid we've run out of time. I think we could talk all day about this stuff. It really is extraordinary exploring these, uh, these, uh, these possibilities. But um, uh, I've enjoyed that very much indeed. Please join me in thanking Michio Kaku. Right.